Content warning. The following video contains light discussion of childhood SA, SA-related trauma, and BDSM. Viewer discretion is advised. Gerald's Game is, for me, easily one of the most disturbing novels within Stephen King's extensive bibliography. And not because of any monstrous creatures or otherworldly evil, though those elements are included in the story as well. But what is genuinely distressing about Gerald's Game is the way it incorporates childhood trauma and addresses the ways in which that trauma can manifest itself in the victim's adulthood. It's a representation of the repercussions of not processing or dealing directly with those unfortunate events which have affected people in their youth, and the consequences, the reverberations they and those they love can face as a result of avoiding them. But we're mostly going to talk about bondage today. Yep, we're we're doing this, so strap in. Hi there, I'm your host, Mr. Doyle, and this is a great undertaking. If you're interested in deep dives into the novels of Stephen King, having broader conversations about the themes and subtext that can be found within them, and watching me wear costumes which have gotten exceedingly difficult to explain to my wife, especially when she opens a package containing these items specifically without her knowing the context behind why I've purchased them, please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel. This is the first video in a two-part series for the novel Gerald's Game, which saw publication in 1992, and the second video in this series will be for the 2017 Netflix feature-length film adaptation. This was going to be one of my more serious, likely somewhat personal videos, but as I started writing this script, I found that I knew what I wanted to discuss, or rather, what I felt were relevant topics I could potentially discuss, but they were either a bit too personal or just potentially upsetting. Not only for me, but likely for some of you kind folks who watch these videos, and no one needs me to bum them out. Uh, plus, a lot of the topics I considered touching on were things I had already discussed in another video this year, so I decided about midway through this script to take a different route and allow myself to have a little fun, while also relating it back to what I had originally wanted to discuss. So, yeah, you probably didn't need to know any of that. Moving on, I'm not sure how YouTube will react to the topics and language that will inevitably come up in this one, so it feels a bit like playing a delicate game of algorithmic roulette. The last video I did where things got a little sexual performed terribly. That was my video for The Wastelands, and I'm not saying it was definitely because of the fucking a demon to death discussion that the video got below average views, but I don't know, so I'm trying to play it safe-ish. However, I imagine things will go much further this time once we dig into the subject of bondage, BDSM, and their presumed relationship to childhood trauma, but who knows? Just so we're clear, I'm not into bondage, which is something I might be talking about later, and, and no shade if you are uh, to each their own, but I purchased this costume online and I had to Google a bunch of stuff about bondage and BDSM for this video. So believe me when I tell you that after searching for those topics and Purchasing these items online, the recommended and targeted ads I've been seeing lately have been just wildly off the mark for me. Rest in peace uh, to my digital footprint. You know what I should have done? I should have used Surfshark VPN, 
Surfshark VPN lets you look up all sorts of kinky stuff anonymously without ruining your browsing history. This is not a sponsored ad. My channel isn't big enough for those yet. I'm just saying it probably would have been a good idea to have used a VPN in this instance. I'll just consider it a valuable learning experience. Come to think of it, I apologize for what watching this video may do to your YouTube recommendations, but it's too late now, so you're welcome. All right, so here's a quick recap of Gerald's game before we go down whatever road my brain and browser history decide to take us on. Gerald's Game, 1992 novel, a brief summary. Jessie and her husband, Gerald, have been married for nearly 20 years, and things have started to get a little stale in the bedroom. The two have been trying to spice up their love life, though, with varying degrees of success. In the pursuit of rekindling their flame, Jessie and Gerald take a day drive to their secluded summer home, where they have agreed to escalate their bedroom activities. Gerald introduces handcuffs into the mix, which he uses to affix Jessie's wrists to the bedposts, and after finding herself becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the situation and discovering that she is frankly repulsed by her husband, she changes her mind and asks Gerald to let her out of the restraints. Gerald isn't listening, though. He thinks it's all part of the game, and that Jessie's sudden change of heart is just her playing hard to get. However, Jessie is not kidding, and the longer Gerald refuses her request to be released, the more furious and desperate she becomes. Eventually, an accident of sorts occurs, and Gerald is no longer able to help her out of the handcuffs. In fact, Gerald is no longer able to do much of anything, and Jessie, who is wearing nothing but a pair of panties and two sets of handcuffs, finds herself incapacitated and unable to help Gerald or herself. As time passes, Jessie's situation becomes more and more calamitous. Her needs for water, for food, and to use the bathroom gradually become the least of her worries. She finds herself a captive audience for a number of visitors, both within and outside of her own mind. Additionally, she is forced to confront some hard truths and repressed memories from her past, to revisit a series of traumatic events which likely led her into this deadly predicament. She was an unwilling participant. She was an unwilling participant in. As these distressing memories flood back into the forefront of Jessie's consciousness, she discovers within her a will to survive and to escape this sexual escapade gone terribly wrong, and the sinister forces that have discovered her in her helpless state. But in order to confront her current reality, she must come to terms with the horrendous experience she has suffered many years ago on the day the sun went out. History and Background An article from the website Bustle.com surmised that parts of Gerald's game were likely inspired by the satanic ritual abuse panic of the early 90s and the resulting instances of false memory syndrome that occurred. The article reads, quote, Authors never work in a vacuum, and the story's strong emphasis on freeing oneself from victim culture was likely inspired inspired by reality as well. The debate over how memory works and whether memories can be utterly repressed and recovered raged in the media for months, and it's probably not a coincidence that Gerald's game's Jesse struggles with the very same issues." Unquote. I had discussed the science of suppressed and repressed memories as well as false memory syndrome and the satanic ritual abuse panic of the 90s in my video for the library policeman. So I won't be going in depth about those topics in this video, but I must say there are a number of parallels and shared subject matter between the two stories, the library policeman and Gerald's game. 
Both stories feature repressed memories, childhood SA, a terrifying physical manifestation of that traumatic childhood experience, and the protagonist facing and vanquishing that physical manifestation, which can best be interpreted as overcoming or reckoning with that repressed childhood trauma. If you're interested in hearing more about all of that, check out the Library Policeman video. I do agree with Bustle that those topics are relevant and applicable to Gerald's game in a number of ways, so but, you know, I just didn't want to revisit and rehash those same issues and topics for this video. Uh, so link to the Library Policeman video down below. As many of my fellow OG King stands know, Gerald's game is tied to King's 1993 novel Dolores Claiborne. However, I'm of the opinion that were you to remove the ties to Dolores Claiborne, which are by no means substantive or consequential, the story and message conveyed in Gerald's game would be virtually unchanged. King has done things like this throughout his writing career, just dropping in references or instances from his other stories, but this was the first time he inserted something from a story that had not yet seen publication. It was a sort of foreshadowing for Dolores Claiborne. However, I felt that the way in which he tied Gerald's game to his yet-to-be-published book was kind of lazy. I may change my mind on that after I revisit Dolores Claiborne, though, so I reserve the right to alter this opinion in the future should my re-root, re-root, I am fucking up a lot in this video so far. That's like five flubs already. What the fuck? So I reserve the right to alter this opinion in the future should my re-read prove that assessment wrong. In a 1992 Fresh Air interview with host Jerry Gross on NPR, King discussed what inspired him to write Gerald's Game. Apparently, the idea began with King's 1981 novel Cujo. King had been ruminating on how in Cujo he had written about a woman and her son being trapped in a car, two people trapped in a small space. That got him thinking about what would happen if it was just one person, a woman, alone. But why would this woman be stuck in a room by herself? According to King, quote, The answer that I came up with was bondage, and that forced me to consider what causes people to do this sort of thing. Unquote. King then worked from there to figure out how the rest of Jesse's story would play out. So, bondage. That's, that's what King decided to go with, and well, so did I, which is inarguably a provocative approach. So let's start there and look into what King may have discovered for himself when he considered and examined what causes people to become interested and participate in bondage, and hell, maybe we'll even talk about my sex life, just for kicks. But first, won't you please consider liking this video, subscribing to the channel, and sticking around to see what lengths I'm willing to go with these costumes. Who knows? I mean, maybe I'll take this channel in a full-on BDSM direction, because let's be honest. You like what you see. Bondage, BDSM, and Trauma As King stated, it was by way of bondage that he determined just how he would trap Jesse, our lead protagonist, in Gerald's game. Jesse's husband, Gerald, had convinced her to try some light bondage previously, but nothing too risque, and while they haven't escalated far beyond that initial experimentation, as far as bondage and BDSM go, handcuffs are rookie shit, Gerald is eager to explore these new and exciting escapades further. By the way, if, if you're like me and and don't actually know what BDSM stands for because, like me, you're what might be considered vanilla in the bedroom, but hey, vanilla ice cream is delicious, so shut up and stop making fun of me. It means bondage, discipline or domination, sadism, and masochism. So how did Jesse and Gerald get here? What led them to try these 
more taboo bedroom tactics. Well, according to Jesse and the various voices in her head, things had just gotten boring in the bedroom. After 17 years of marriage, it just wasn't exciting anymore, and that's not unheard of. In fact, I imagine it's a fairly common story. The thrill was lost, and Jesse and Gerald, particularly Gerald, wanted to make it spicy again, to reinvigorate their sexual relationship. It's fairly simple, really. Or is it? Over the course of many years, psychologists have surmised and theorized that folks who enjoy and participate in these less mainstream bedroom activities are more likely to have suffered from some sort of childhood SA. These theories go as far back as Sigmund Freud and for a while were considered sound psychology. And as anyone who has read this story knows, Jesse was indeed a victim of a traumatic SA instance perpetrated by her own father when she was only 11 years old. So when King says he had been forced to consider what causes people to do this sort of thing, at first glance one might potentially assume that he was alluding to Jesse's trauma factoring into her interest in bondage. However, it wasn't Jesse who advocated or pushed for the implementation and escalation of bondage in the bedroom. Uh, my front light just flickered and died. Hopefully that's okay. In fact, we come to find out she isn't really into it, like at all. Rather, it was Gerald who introduced and enjoyed placing Jesse in the restraints, and we don't know nearly as much intimate detail about Gerald in regards to his past and certainly not about his potential history with childhood SA. Back in the early 90s and prior to that decade, the Freudian way of thinking regarding the link between childhood SA leading to interest in what may be considered more violent bedroom behaviors was still in vogue. But as is often the case, Sigmund Freud and his theories were later debunked and disproven by more scientifically sound studies. In a 2021 article entitled, Studies Provide New Insights into Possible Psychological Mechanisms Underlying Interest in BDSM, which can be found on SciPost.com, psychiatric researcher Anna Schwerwegen I'm, I'm certain I'm pronouncing that one right, and her colleagues at the Collaborative Antwerp Psychiatric Research Institute discussed what their examinations and findings in regards to how BDSM was related to past trauma. Schwerwegen and the Institute's findings, which had been published in the scientific journals Sexuality Research and Social Policy, as well as Archives of Sexual Behavior, indicated that such practices as bondage and BDSM are likely not pathological in general. In the article, Schwerwegen states, quote, the past five years, BDSM gained a significant amount of attention and popularity in the general population, partly due to the Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy. Yet despite this increasing popularity, there still seem to exist several misconceptions about BDSM and BDSM practitioners in the general population, i.e. people who don't practice BDSM on a regular basis. Nevertheless, only very little empirical research existed about BDSM and its possible driving psychological mechanisms. Therefore, our research group conducted a survey study in both the general population and BDSM population in order to obtain more insight in BDSM." Unquote. The article continues saying that in one study, the researchers surveyed 771 BDSM practitioners and 518 non-practitioners to examine whether BDSM was a maladaptive coping mechanism in response to traumatic experiences early in life, meaning that someone may adopt BDSM in adulthood as a coping mechanism in direct response to childhood SA. Here is what Schierwegen says the study revealed. Quote, the hypothesis of a link between childhood trauma and BDSM was not supported by the results of our study. Little to no evidence was found for a link between childhood trauma and the onset of BDSM interests. 
the main conclusion is that BDSM practices cannot simply be framed as a possible coping strategy for experienced trauma." Unquote. The study did explore other topics and additionally concluded that, of those surveyed, higher levels of impulsivity were also found among BDSM practitioners who identified as submissives and switches, but not those who identified as dominants. Schwierwegen's study was perhaps not without its limitations. As Schwierwegen herself admits, it is possible that folks in the BDSM community may have tried to portray themselves differently in an effort to change the beliefs and perception of their community by the non-practicing population. Oh, and the studies only examined Dutch-speaking individuals, so there is that to consider, I suppose. The article concludes with Schwerwegen stating, quote, there are still several persistent misconceptions about BDSM and BDSM practitioners in the general population, partly due to the lack of empirical research and the dissemination of inaccurate information on the subject in mainstream media. These misconceptions often lead to stigmatizing attitudes and discrimination towards BDSM practitioners. Therefore, more empirical research on this topic and its underlying psychological mechanisms is essential in order to limit further stigmatization of this group." Unquote. So this lone study on its own would perhaps not be substantial enough to prove that folks who practice BDSM in the bedroom are typically not victims of childhood SA, but I managed to find a handful of additional studies and surveys that all seem to corroborate Schurwegen's findings. I've linked a few articles below for anyone interested, but suffice it to say that all of these articles and studies ultimately conclude that there is no integral link between childhood trauma and an interest in BDSM. And regularly, these same studies found that folks who are into that sort of thing are generally happy, outgoing, extroverted, adventurous individuals. So why do people get into kinky stuff? Well, that's not entirely clear, but suffice it to say, some people just like to be adventurous and try different things. Different strokes for different folks, as the saying goes. So when it comes to Jesse and Gerald, King got it right. He didn't attribute the implementation of bedroom bondage to previous childhood trauma. It seems that Gerald just wanted to explore some rougher terrain than Jesse was interested in because Gerald just got bored, I guess. And that sucks, you know? I can understand why perhaps the sex lives of monogamous partners could get stale or unexciting after many years because, if I may return to an earlier analogy, after eating vanilla ice cream every day, year after year, you might want to try another flavor. Personally, I've been with my wife for 15 years now, and well, I, I can't relate. But there is a good reason for that, which is something I think I'll save for my next video. Maybe. Final thoughts. Gerald's game is a harrowing tale, and it goes way beyond a story of a married couple's bondage play gone wrong. There is a dark presence that we're never entirely sure if it's a manifestation of Jesse's fraying mind, like right up until the very end. And there's the whole Gerald eating dog thing. It all makes for an intense page turner that I definitely recommend. You should read it. Um, Unless you were a victim of childhood essay, and in that case, this story might be too much for you. So if, if that sort of thing might be triggering, you're gonna likely want to avoid this one, but you've probably figured that out by now. In my next video and the second entry in the Gerald's Game series, I'll be taking a look at the Netflix film adaptation, which was released in 2017 and was directed by the phenomenally talented Mike Flanagan. I watched the movie once when it first came out and haven't watched it since, so I'm looking forward to checking it out again and seeing what it inspires. Thanks for watching. Please click the things and I'll see you next time. Okay, goodbye.
Be sure to click like and subscribe to the channel for my continued analysis of all things Stephen King. I'm your host, Mr. Doyle, and this has been A Great Undertaking.